Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, a very warm welcome to this policy forum of the International Conference on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. For those of you who attended the inaugural ceremony where uh, Prime Ministers from four countries gave their inaugural addresses, would remember that, would recall that the whole theme of what does it all mean, uh, what we've gone through in the last one year in terms of uh, how do we stay on track uh, while uh, moving towards achieving the sustainable development goals, uh, the targets enshrined in Sendai framework, uh, the, uh, the commitments made under uh, the Paris Agreement. So to delve into some of those questions, uh, we have a very eminent panel here, here this afternoon, uh, a, a very interesting mix. Uh, global leaders working on the forefront uh, of resilience building efforts in infrastructure sectors and more widely. Uh, we have uh, Dr. P.K. Mishra. He is the Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister of India. We have Madam Mami Mizutori. She is the Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General on Disaster Risk Reduction Issues. We have uh, UNDP's Administrator, Mr. Akim Steiner, uh, UNDP is a global leader. She, uh, UNDP is uh, the UN system's lead uh, global development agency and in a sense custodian of the sustainable development goals. We have a CEO of Willis Tower Watson, Mr. John Haley. Uh, he is also the chair of uh, the, the, the coalition that was established last year, Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, closely collaborating with CDRI. And we are fortunate to have with us Dr. John Merton. Uh, he has very important responsibility for the, coming, for, for the rest of this year as the envoy of COP26. So um, we will um, just uh, move right on. And uh, in order to sort of set the stage, uh, I would like to invite Dr. P.K. Mishra to give a keynote address. Dr. P.K. Mishra is the principal secretary to the prime minister. Uh, he is a change maker, he is a civil servant, and he is a scholar. Uh, in 2019, the United Nations bestowed upon him the Sasakawa Award for Excellence in Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, in a lot of disaster risk reduction work that is happening in India, and in fact in some other countries as well, you can, if you look closely enough, you can find his fingerprints. Uh, whether it is the, the advocacy he has done with the Finance Commission or the work he has done in the past in the insurance sector, the new standards of recovery uh, after disasters. Uh, Dr. P.K. Mishra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Kamal Kishore. UNDP Administrator, Mr. Ekim Steiner. Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General, Ms. Mami Bijuthori, Willis Tower Watson, CEO and Chair of the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Investment, Mr. John Haley, India Co-Chair of the CDRI Executive Committee, Mr. Kamal Kishore. It is indeed an honor and privilege for me to have been asked to deliver this keynote address before a panel where we have leaders who are in charge of driving global investment and action towards achieving the sustainable development goals and targets enshrined in the Paris Agreement and the Sendai Framework. This coming together holds a lot of promise The world is getting better equipped to face the challenges posed by the pandemic. Although it is anybody's guess how long the tale of this pandemic will be. Many lessons learned during the last one year are important for the resilience of the planet, its people and economy. In other sessions, there would be more detailed deliberations 
on those lessons. So I will not repeat them here. However, I must repeat the much used, perhaps overused phrase, the world has changed. The world has changed. Even before the pandemic, we were going through multiple transitions from carbon intensive sources of energy to clean energy, from rural to urban, profound changes in the nature of work, to name only a few of the transitions. Whether or not the pandemic will accelerate or slow some of these transitions is yet to be seen. But it is clear that infrastructure systems will underpin all of these transitions. Over the last two centuries, development of infrastructure has unleashed human potential in unprecedented ways. Countries that have invested strategically in infrastructure have created opportunities for their people to flourish. But as the pandemic reminds us, we can no longer take the robustness of our infrastructure system for granted. The impacts of the pandemic have rippled across the world and affected all areas of human endeavor. If there was ever a need for evidence in favor of a systemic approach in the shadows of the pandemic, it is easily available. We have to build not only resilient infrastructure assets, but also resilient infrastructure systems that accelerate our transition to net zero emissions over the coming decades. How are we going to do that? This would require a deep and dynamic understanding of risks to infrastructure, as well as risks from infrastructure. However, many countries do not yet have the capacities to undertake such analysis. Availability of high-resolution data on hazards, exposure, and vulnerability of infrastructure systems is highly uneven across the world. While there can be no substitute for investing in the building blocks of such analytical capacity at the national and subnational levels, global cooperation can accelerate the process. Open data platforms, common risk metrics, combined with application of recent achievements in data sciences and geospatial technologies can help countries leapfrog to the necessary analytical capacity to support integrated infrastructure planning. This will enable us to address the dual challenges of physical risks and transition risks to a low carbon economy simultaneously. This, we hope, will create a space and incentive for more financial resources to flow into sustainable and resilient infrastructure, especially in the developing world to enable us to meet key SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, over this decade. A unique characteristic of the modern world is that while risk is global in the sense that Everybody is affected by actions taken elsewhere. Resilient is local. 
On the one hand, we need to make the global system resilient. And on the other hand, we have to invest in local resilience to make this global resilience possible. Striking a balance between the efficiency of a highly interconnected global system and resilience at the local level is a unique challenge of our times. When it comes to local resilience, I would like to reiterate the point I, that I made at the last edition of this annual event. This is about the agency of the people and communities that our infrastructure systems seek to serve. We must remember that infrastructure, whether we term it physical or social infrastructure, is ultimately about people. And it must lead to sustainable development outcomes for the people. So how do we bring in the voices of the communities in the way we plan, design, and build, and operate the, and maintain infrastructure? This goes beyond the quantitative methods, however sophisticated, of analysis of infrastructure planning. This is about good risk governance in and across infrastructure sectors. I would like to now turn our attention to another unique challenge that faces humanity. When some of our ancestors built infrastructure, for example, the Roman aqueducts, the Roman aqueducts, or the system of interconnected lakes here in Udaipur, India. They served us for centuries, and in some cases, even a millennium. Now, more than ever before, we are living in a time of rapid transition. How do we build infrastructure in a manner that it is not only resilient to more direct and visible shocks, but is also able to adapt to multiple transitions that are rippling through the global system. What kind of optionality can we build in our infrastructure systems so that they can continually adapt to these changes? What can be the role of nature-based solutions to this? Do we have fit-for-purpose institutions that can look at gray, green, and blue infrastructure, both human-made and ecological infrastructure, in an integrated manner? I hope today's high-level panel, as also the rest of this conference, will delve into some of these issues. In closing, I would like to say that the conversation on resilient infrastructure must be enlarged. It cannot remain confined to the conventional set of stakeholders. It also cannot remain limited to traditional topics. It needs to embrace a multidisciplinary approach with particular emphasis on the role of social sciences and bring in a wider set of stakeholders. I very much look forward to the ideas, insights, and suggestions the panelists will present in this session and the directions that CDRI would derive from these conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mishra, there were several uh, takeaways in your remarks uh, from uh, not just looking at risk to infrastructure, but also risk from infrastructure, investing in local resilience as well as resilience of the global system, your emphasis on agency of people, your, your emphasis that our infrastructure needs to be resilient 
not just to the, the current known shocks, but also the multiple transitions that are happening across the world. Uh, the, your emphasis on enlarging the conversation and not just staying among so-called experts, but also you know, have a wider engagement really resonates well with us. So in the next segment of this, uh, this session, uh, what we will do is I have four distinguished panelists. I will uh, pose questions to them and we will try to have a conversation around those questions uh, and, and derive insights from their experiences. Let me start with uh, SRSG, uh, Mami Mizutori first. SRSG, um, ever since I have been working with you, you have been talking about the notion of systemic risk. Uh, 2019 Global Platform, I think that was uh, the catchphrase, that was the most repeated, this thing. And you were almost prophetic uh, in, in doing that, you and your agency. And now we have been through a difficult year. What does it mean for the future of resilience? Uh, how do we stay on track uh, when it comes to achieving uh, the targets, the seven targets uh, that we committed to under the Sendai framework almost exactly six years ago? Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Kishore. Um, I'm delighted to be here with Dr. P.K. Mishra and the distinguished panelists. This timing of this uh, conference could not have been uh, better. Uh, we are at the eve of the Sendai framework adaptation uh, tomorrow, six years ago in Sendai. Last week was the 10th anniversary of the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami, where there was this massive um, nuclear power plant um, accident, but it was a disaster. It was a man-made disaster. and. Uh, and we are in the midst of COVID-19, just one year from it. Now, uh, Kamal, you mentioned about uh, the global platform two years ago here in Geneva, where we launched the UN flagship report for disaster risk. And indeed, systemic risk was the core uh, theme. But when I look back, I think probably not many people understood what we were talking about. Although we spoke about the risk drivers, they're all connected, the impact is cascading and it's systemic, but now everybody knows what it means because a tiny virus that emerged in one part of the world has started a public health crisis, which is now a global socioeconomic crisis, which is affecting everybody. So now everybody talks about systemic risk. And what does this mean for building resilience um, for achieving the Sendai framework? Well, a systemic risk needs a systemic solution. And it means that sectors have to work together. They cannot work in silos and all stakeholders must work together. If you take the example of COVID-19, the countries where the public health authorities coordinated well with the disaster management authorities, uh, I think India was the case, uh, they managed better than other countries. And this is exactly the kind of um, approach that is needed. And we talk about uh, this COVID-19 as a one in 100 years um, disaster, but I fear that probably that is going to become more of a norm. The unpredictable will be the predictable. And in this time, uh, what we need to think about in terms of achieving the Sendai framework, and especially the target about reducing loss to critical infrastructure and disrupting basic service is one that we cannot underinvest anymore in public health and in any other infrastructure, because the result is what you see loss of lives, loss of livelihoods, and trillions of dollars, loss of education. So underinvestment in infrastructure is something that cannot be permitted anymore. Second is that because of the systemic risk, it's not enough to have resilient infrastructure in terms of its hardware or even in its software. It has to be a resilient infrastructure system where all the infrastructure system needs to work, power, water, transportation, if any of these collapse, then the health infrastructure will not work. And then the third point that I wanted to bring in is uh, what Dr. P.K. Mishra put down. 
agency of people, we have once again seen that disasters this time really is affecting everybody, but not everybody equally. When you think about the children in developing countries where there is uh, this digital divide, how can they you know, make up with this loss of education? This will impact on their whole lives. So we need to rebuild the infrastructure in this recovery from COVID, not only in a resilient way, not only in a greener way, but in an equitable way. And that will make the basic service accessible to those who are most in need of this. My final point is, um, I think, you know, we were talking about, um, Kamal, uh, how do we stay in co on course uh, towards achieving the Sendai framework? Well, I, I must say that we were never on course. Um, people weren't really working on prevention. We were still basically focusing on response and recovery. But now finally, we have this chance to focus on disaster risk management, not disaster management as the Sendai framework says. So now we are going to go on course and we need to stay on course because we only have 10 years to accomplish this. And if we can't accomplish the Sendai framework, the SDGs cannot be accomplished. Over to you, Kaman. Uh, thank you very much, SRSG. That's a hard hitting phrase. We were never on course. It's not just the pandemic. Even before that, we were not never on course. And this is really a time for reflection and really getting on the course. Uh, before I turn over to Administrator Steiner, uh, I just want to tell our audience that if you have any questions, uh, you can put them on the Q&A in the platform, and we'll come to those later. So, uh, Mr. Akim Steiner, uh, after a short um, New Year's break, when I got back to the office, the first thing I saw on my table was a report with a red cover. Red is a sense of urgency and it was UNDP's uh, Human Development Report. Normally, when one opens such a report, one goes to the table of content, but for some reason, I started to read your foreword. And the first line stuck with me. It said, hidden in the shadow of COVID-19, 2020 has been a dark year. And then you go on, uh, and you basically highlight a very stark choice, a choice between a choice before humanity that are we going to be remembered by fossils we leave behind or a more just balance between the planet and its people. And then basically the report goes into much greater depth about it and you talk about how, what are the mechanisms for catalyzing those change. For the first time, there is uh, the notion of uh, a human development index, which is uh, planetary pressures adjusted. Now, in all of this, where does infrastructure and resilient infrastructure fit in? Uh, the fact is that for a large part of the world, we have huge infrastructure deficit. How do we advance that? How do we close that gap while also addressing the concerns of fairness, of justice, of not leaving you know, fossils behind? Thank you, um, dear Kamal Kishore. Thank you for inviting me <clears throat> to join you all and uh, special greetings to Dr. Mishra. Also, I listened with um, great care as always when you speak and uh, to my fellow panelists, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you um, in this discussion and to go straight to the point, infrastructure features everywhere, I think, in the way that we conceive of, of both development but also the future of development. And, um, again, Kamal, thank you for the reference to this year's or the 2020 Human Development Report, because what it gave expression to is that there are times in, in human history when we are not just talking about incremental choices. There are moments of transformative choice. And I think uh, Dr. Mishra, Mami already spoke to it, and I'm sure so will my fellow panelists in a moment. We are, in a sense, in that shadow of COVID-19, which... Um, has disrupted everything and, and even on the human development uh, side, it is our estimation that for the first time in 30 years, human development will actually reverse in terms of the index and the measurements that UNDP has brought to it. So this is a disruptive moment of not just psychological and in terms of a health crisis and a virus, it is deeply disruptive to 
pathways of development, assumptions that we have held, and the urgency with which to rethink how we move forward. And here I think infrastructure clearly is emblematic, but it is also fundamental to the way that we will either build forward better or try to scramble back to where we were. The latter is usually where we by instinct go. And yet if you acknowledge both the lessons and um, almost the x-ray of our societies and our economies that COVID has allowed us to, to see, then also the notion of living in an age of the Anthropocene where choices truly matter in an intergenerational, in a planetary sense, then clearly this is a moment very much along the lines that Dr. Mishra spoke to just now. We need to be very clear about not only the choices we have, but also the consequences that are associated with those choices. And here, I would argue that infrastructure allows us best to answer the question of what kind of infrastructure, what kind of investments we need by using the sustainable development goals. At the end of the day, these 17 sustainable development goals are not a magic formula, but they capture what I often refer to as the, the great risks of our time that need to be addressed in the way that we make choices about development. And infrastructure is the front line, particularly in developing nations that still are building fundamental infrastructure but also in developed nations. And let us remember the SDGs, that 2030 agenda is a universal agenda. And so different um, choices, different realities, but ultimately we are trying to see if we can transition with the infrastructure of the 21st century into an age where development is not depleting the planet's resources, not reducing our resilience, not making us more vulnerable. And I think two areas, if I can just briefly touch on them, would be, first of all, financing. You saw um, in the last year a lot of um, very um, distressed national debates about how to use limited fiscal resources, how to make priority choices. I think managing the crisis and COVID is one element, but UNDP very early on pleaded that the crisis response needs to already have within it the DNA of a recovery and a development investment strategy. Otherwise, countries will simply lack the means to invest. So financing is critical. The Secretary General with the Financing for Development Dialogues has tried to alert the world, not only the short-term debt distress and, and many of the other challenges that governments face, but also how to invest forward. And I think whether you look at the energy sector as one example of infrastructure, whether you look at, for example, also the, the digital universe, India, um, I think recognized very early on in this crisis how significant digital connectivity would be um, with the government announcing a program to connect over close to, I think, half a million villages with fiber optic in the next 1,000 days. It's an extremely ambitious goal, but this is part of the infrastructure that recognizes, first of all, how technology can help us address uh, people's vulnerabilities, secondly, address inequality, because leaving behind too many people in a rapidly evolving digital economy and also in an energy transition will leave too many behind. So designing with these lenses is critical. I end by thanking Dr. Mishra also for pointing out one more issue just now. We often talk about infrastructure only in terms of the built up environment. It is buildings, roads, uh, railways, bridges, um, harbors. We also need to look at the ecological infrastructure of our economies. And I use that term very deliberately because in our river basins, in our forests that are the watersheds that produce the water in the wetlands that uh, allow our hydrological systems to function in the mangrove forests that uh, you know mommy will speak to that i'm sure with great uh, enthusiasm and competence lies some of the resilience and adaptation capacity restoration of um, degraded lands the ecological infrastructure has to be part of this and so far Oxford University and UNEP last week published a report, only 16% of the stimulus packages are really investing in that green recovery and green development uh, pathway forward. That should be a warning sign to us that right now we may still not be on the kind of trajectory that I think we all in principle agree, but it is what we do in practice. The development choices and decisions, not of 10 years from now, but literally of today and tomorrow. Back to you. Thank you, Administrator. I think a stark reminder that we are at a moment of reckoning. Uh, the choice is not between making an incremental change and not making it. The choice is between 
making a transformative change or, or not making it. You covered a wide ground. You said only 16 percent of stimulus packages are going into infrastructure uh, sectors. Uh, at, one, uh, at one point I wanted to hear 60 percent, but then I, 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 I think I listened properly and that was 16 percent. Much too low. You highlighted how uh, crisis response is an opportunity to uh, have a, a, a forward looking recovery strategy, a development strategy for a more just and fair society. Uh, let me now turn over to uh, our colleagues from uh, the private sector, Mr. John Haley. Uh, you know, you have brought together under your leadership uh, a very wide coalition of uh, private sector actors who are addressing some of the financing issues that uh, the administrator was just talking about and SRSG just uh, alluded to. Uh, what does the COVID-19 crisis uh, mean for you? Uh, what does it mean for your climate resilient investment? What are the lessons that are transferred from 2020 to our planning into the future? Mr. John uh, Daly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kamal. And it's a uh, great pleasure to be in this session with uh, Dr. Mishra and with my uh, distinguished panelist. Um, let me first talk about how the private sector um, looks at risk. And basically, it tends to be from a purely um, just a rational quantitative angle. It's a calculation of the uh, probability and the severity of a given event uh, in a given activity against what the uh, investors' expectations were. And when it comes to risk adjusted returns, the risk appetite or profile of a given firm depends on whether the level of risk adjusted return is acceptable. For higher levels of risk, then you were looking for a higher level of return. And in terms of the horizons, the maturity of the investments and the liquidity are what define the risks and the expected return. And this is where physical climate risks have a massive impact on infrastructure investments. Because when you look at the attributes that make infrastructure as an asset class um, attractive, uh, it's a long-term source of cash flows, uh, stable cash flows, tends to be uncorrelated to public equity market. Physical climate risks present a real challenge to all of these attributes. And these are the kind of things that the private sector needs to take into account when they are um, analyzing these potential infrastructure investments. And the concern, I think, of the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment is that, in fact, that there's not good data and there's not good analysis to take these into account. And in particular, that the lack of the tools and the lack of the analytics and the lack of the data means that we invest in less resilient infrastructure than we really ought to. It's less resilient infrastructure um, from the standpoint of investors, because in fact, uh, better analytics would have pointed to building more resilient infrastructure and the returns would have been better. It's also less resilient infrastructure from the viewpoint of society in terms of what happens to the economy, uh, what happens to people, and especially what happens to the most vulnerable people. And so the focus of the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment is to get these better analytics, get this data, and in particular, to maybe have a better appreciation of um, the, the time frame. What happens in the traditional investment in infrastructure right now is the, the risks are not recognized and they tend to occur later in the process. If we can bring them forward to be recognized earlier and set against the cost, we think that there will be a much stronger case for resilient investment. So that's, that's fundamentally um, what we're trying to accomplish. And you asked about the impact of um, the pandemic and COVID-19. And I think that has had a profound impact on the understanding of risk uh, across uh, all of society, but especially in the private sector. I think there's a notion of um, long tail risk and the reality of that 
that has just fundamentally changed. And I think back to back in the 80s when I first got involved in doing asset liability modeling, the, the standard models we had then were built on normal distributions. And I remember um, looking at the chance of the uh, an event like the Great Depression, and the standard model said it was once in 5,000 years. And I remember thinking that, you know, an event that occurred only 50 years ago, if your model says that it's going to happen once in 50 centuries, you probably have the wrong model. Uh, but in fact, what happens is these models tend to be built uh, to what's easier mathematically than actually what is um, what, what's uh, what's reality. With the models we have for some of the long tail or the fatter risks like pandemics and things, we've had them around and people have looked at them, but they didn't have the same kind of reality now that an actual event has struck. And I think this changing perception of long tail risk and the reality of it will affect not just pandemic risk, it'll affect things like cyber, it'll affect things like climate change. And that's going to have a tremendously positive effect because these risks are real. And we're seeing a, a proliferation, I think, of long tail risk. So it's not just an assessment of how much more likely they are than maybe we thought, but it's also an assessment of there are more long tail risks out there than we thought, and we need to uh, be incorporating and planning for them. And if you think about COVID-19 and the profound um, educational effect it's had on the, well, really all of society and all of the uh, private sector, it basically says, if you're not prepared for these things, you are going to be in real trouble. And so efficient preparation and planning doesn't eliminate it, but it can minimize the impact. And for the private sector, I think one of the things it tells us is it can deliver uh, an invaluable competitive advantage. There's a parallelism to the flattening the curve that we looked at with COVID-19 and some of the things we need to do to prepare for climate change. Of course, the, the time considerations are different. Instead of weeks, we need years or, or decades of consistent action. But I think some of these lessons we need to adapt them and we need to bring them into the climate change debate. And I think the 16% that uh, Occam Steiner uh, talked about is, uh, is quite disheartening. On the other hand, I, I do take a little comfort in, as we see more stimulus packages uh, being rolled out, and, and we see this in the U.S. right now with the coming stimulus packages, there is more of a, a emphasis on uh, climate and on a green approach to some of these stimulus packages than I think we would have seen even just a couple of years ago. So I, uh, I, I recognize how terrible the 16% is, but perhaps I'm a little more encouraged uh, than, than just that number would indicate. Um, I think the one thing, though, that we need to make sure, and this is another particular focus of CCRI, is that as we build analytics and data, or as we build plans to uh, build in a, um, a green fashion, we need to make sure that developing countries are not left behind. Because when we get better analytics and better pricing, if it turns out that we need to build in more resilience, we wanna make sure that we're providing the vulnerable countries, those, those most vulnerable to uh, physical climate risks and the developing countries that have the most need for this, we need to make sure that we give them the, uh, the support and the wherewithal to uh, develop this resilient infrastructure. And that is what really fundamentally requires a good private-public partnership. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. John Haley. Those were very, very uh, interesting comments. You covered a lot of ground. I think the quote of the day is the long tail risk and the perception of long, long tail risk has fundamentally changed. Uh, it affects everything we do and we must not lose this moment of extraordinary educational effect that COVID-19 has had on all of us. I think your point on uh, developing uh, countries should not be left behind, whether it is in terms of finance or anal analytics, it sort of speaks to the point Dr. Mishra was making in his uh, keynote speech of really leapfrogging. There isn't, there isn't a lot of time. We really have to make um, a swift progress. Uh, let me go back to SRSG. SRSG, you 
made a very strong statement that we were never on course. Uh, so, you know, it's not as if COVID-19 has, COVID-19 has, may have made it just a bit, bit more worse or much more worse, uh, but we were never on course. So, if you had one ask of uh, the national governments, what would that be? Thank you, Kamal. And actually, um, Dr. Mishra already um, answered your question. It is all about governance. It's good risk governance uh, that we need to, uh, to be on course. It's about a clear vision. It's about a clear plan of disaster risk reduction, about rules, regulations, and institutions uh, that manage uh, disaster risk based on rules and regulations. So uh, today we, um, we uh, published this, um, I, I don't think maybe you can't see it, but it's a report that UNDOR published. It's called Addressing Infrastructure, a Failure, Data Gaps, a Governance Challenge. And this is related to what uh, Mr. Haley just mentioned. So member states are asked to report on their disaster losses to UNDRR. And there are seven targets and the target to which the least amount of data comes in is about loss to critical infrastructure and disruption to basic service. There are many reasons. Uh, one is, okay, what is critical infrastructure? Member states, when they got together to discuss this uh, several years ago, they said education, health, but the others were just other infrastructure. So there's not a clear, clear grouping. The standard of resilience is also something that the global standard of resilience is something that hasn't been looked into well enough either, something that CDRI has to do. There's many countries that doesn't have centralized national database. And a lot of the data is actually in the hands of the private sector. So I think here uh, CDRI has a really unique position because it's a coalition of the member states, uh, the multilateral institutions, but also the private sector. So we do need to tackle the issue of data um, that uh, Mr. Haley said, because unless we know what is the actual impact of disasters on infrastructure, how can we do good governance? Because we can't come up with good policies and we cannot have good regulations. Um, improved regulatory environment is a must for de-risking uh, investment to um, disaster, excuse me, infrastructure financing, which Akim talked about. Uh, so right now we are working with uh, Trinidad, Tobago, Jamaica, and uh, Fiji to, um, to, to look into how can we improve their regulatory environment, which we believe will um, make the access to financing, not only public, but more importantly, the private uh, financing, blended financing uh, enhanced. So the, the, the question, uh, the answer to your question, um, Kamal, is good risk governance. Unless we have that, it's not gonna happen resilient infrastructure. And we need data for that and for that public private partnership as mentioned by Mr. Haley is crucial. So that's my message to the member states. Thank you. Thank you, SRSG. Good risk governance, uh, better management, better collection of and management of data underpinned by public-private partnerships. Uh, let me uh, revert to now um, Administrator Steiner. Uh, in his remarks, Mr. John Haley painted a somewhat more optimistic uh, picture. He said that a number of stimulus packages are now indeed going towards more climate sensitive uh, green investments. So in the context of COVID-19 recovery, and I haven't done the numbers, uh, you know, there is uh, almost all countries are announcing large uh, stimulus packages. How does the UN system as a whole, as well as uh, UNDP, uh, intend to work with the governments? Uh, UNDP especially has presence in more than 130 countries, works very closely with uh, governments, use this opportunity to, uh, to sort of push for the kind of transformative change uh, that the Human Development Report of 2020 talks about. Thank you, Kamal. I think we, we all, I think, uh, look to the future with optimism. So let me just say uh, also to John Haley, I, I agree with you. I think the signals that are now emerging are indeed of a 
quantitative and qualitative nature that should allow us to truly believe that we are in a transformative uh, moment in time. But my caution is only to say, even after the financial crisis in, in 2008, 2009, we saw how the gravitational pull to what one knows and uh, feels at home with is always very strong. And yet we all know that this is a pivotal moment. It is a moment in which we have to pivot forward. It takes enormous courage and, and vision also and leadership. I think the UN as a whole, first of all, the Secretary General, the whole UN system in the midst of this pandemic, I think has proven those wrong who think that a institution that is committed to the collective capacity to manage crisis is somehow an anachronism. Um, imperfection is woven into our public institutions, so this is no apology for some of the shortfalls, but truly the idea that we need a COVAX facility, um, that we need the Secretary General to call together prime ministers, presidents around the world to draw attention to the essential role that financing plays in this and looking at issues of debt, not just from a, um, you know, a lender's point of view, but truly from the debt distressed world that is now becoming much more significant. So the first and key role I think of the UN is to help the world realize how it must work together in order to come out of this stronger. Secondly, um, you heard Mami speak just now, whether it is disaster risk reduction, whether it is development, whether it is children, whether it is refugees, um, climate. The UN is providing continuous leadership in terms of helping you know, the public as much as governments to coalesce around opportunities to act. And um, you know, just let me perhaps end on, on the centrality of, of two variables, I think, that will determine how we come out of this. One is public policy. COVID has reminded us how critical government, governance, Mami just referred to it, the role of the state is in the ability of a, a society and a nation, a national economy to manage crisis, but also to send signals. You have just had an election here in the United States. I operate you know, with the headquarters of UNDP out of New York. A stimulus package of extraordinary dimensions has just been passed by Congress, $1.9 trillion. These are epochal investments that are now being made. How can public policy incentivize markets, investors, um, the financial markets, um, industry, the energy sector to now invest forward? And I think it is not about government playing the role of the market, but you know, markets operate within a regulatory framework and they must give expression also to a societal vision of what kind of society we want to live in. Before COVID arrived, we already saw in many countries across the world, increasing polarization, disengagement, frustration, inequality becoming truly a dividing driver. So I think in the way that policy can now incentivize investments in the right direction will also allow us to move forward. And on a very practical level, just this morning with the new development bank, we were accompanying the launch of a new SDG bond because UNDP has been investing a lot in SDG impact, trying to provide a um, standards framework with which not just at the level of principles, but rather when you raise a bond in the financial market, how can you make that bond be transparent in terms of its impact on the SDGs? Because there is significant demand in the financial markets to invest in, let's say, um, programs, projects, um, investment infrastructure that is at least not making problems worth, but is contributing to solving them. We had a similar experience with Mexico. We accompanied an SDG bond onto the European financial markets a few months ago for $750 million. A green sukuk following Islamic principles with Indonesia to raise a billion dollars. These are the new frontiers of where financing infrastructure with public policy, but also with private sector engagement can truly scale up a different kind of investment pathway. And the 16% was simply a reminder that these things don't just happen because we want them to happen. We need to create the conditions within which they can happen. And that is UNDP's work every day across the world, helping governments to determine priorities, but then to leverage financial markets, public policy, to allow a different quality of infrastructure investment to emerge. With climate, with energy, this is a year in which we, I think, are confronted with that choice even more clearly than ever before. And the energy sector worldwide is a central part of the infrastructure investment world. So um, I think 
climate will be a driver, the green transition will be a driver, but it needs smart public policy, incentives to the private sector, and then um, collaboration at the international level. This is the signal that drives markets. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Administrator. I think uh, your reminder is that these things don't just happen. Uh, they require a conducive policy environment and the UN's and UNDP's work with the governments in creating that kind of environment which creates incentives for financial markets to move towards investing in green infrastructure, more resilient infrastructure is, is, is really uh, important work and uh, a lot rests on those efforts. Let me now turn to uh, the COP26 envoy. Uh, everyone here has mentioned COP26. Uh, I have a rather difficult question for you, I think, which is that uh, when we talk about measuring progress on the climate change mitigation side, uh, the metrics are very clear. Uh, so measuring the reduction in emission, you know, there are methods established. Uh, how do you see uh, that on the adaptation side uh, in the second half of November uh, on the way back from Glasgow, how would we measure uh, the success of COP26 from adaptation perspective? Thank you very much, Kamal. And um, it's been a real education being on a panel with such a, a sort of eminent bunch of colleagues um, and lovely to see colleagues like Akim again. Uh, and in that sense, it's good these panels, they, they bring us together with old friends. Um, you said it's, it's simple to measure mitigation uh, at COP26. Um, I'm finding as I get older that, that things, uh, everything was very simple when I was young. And as I get older, things are getting much more complicated. Um, and one of the things which is, is also complicated is measuring mitigation. It's actually not as easy as people think with different baselines uh, and reporting, but I, I don't think that's the question you wanted me to answer. Um, adaptation is, is, of course, as you, as you stress, uh, adaptation and resilience is a greater challenge uh, than mitigation in terms of measuring success. However, difficult mitigation is to measure, adaptation and resilience is, is harder. Um, but just because something is difficult to measure doesn't mean we, we should neglect it. Uh, one of the things that's been really clear uh, for Alok Sharma, the COP president designate as he travels around the world, e even now during COVID, is just that climate change is ongoing and climate impacts are being felt right now. Uh, he's currently on his way to Costa Rica where, you know, that, that's, that's very evident. And he, he, he was in Bhutan recently and he's, he's very keen uh, to stress as he travels around the world uh, what he's seeing that climate impacts are being felt now and we need to, to, to focus a lot of our efforts at COP26, not just on mitigation to reduce climate change in the longer term, but also on adaptation and resilience to, to help support those communities uh, already feeling it. Um, I think success for, for COP26 will turn around three areas. Um, first is planning. We clearly need to improve the preparedness for climate related disasters so that we can uh, minimize and, uh, uh, the effect of disasters and we can address loss and damage uh, thereafter. Uh, and in that, we need to be sure that COP26 takes forward activities that supports national adaptation planning. Uh, we need to ensure that climate risks are incorporated into adaptation planning. Um, and uh, I think as, as, as John Haley sort of very clearly set out, uh, political leaders around the world probably have a, a greater uh, awareness of, of risk and long tail risk than they would have had um, two years ago. The, the pandemic has been terrible for many of our countries and there's been huge human suffering. But if there's one silver lining we can take out of it is that our political leaders will be going into COP26 uh, with an increased awareness of, of long tail risk. So hopefully that will enable us to generate greater investments in risk monitoring, uh, and in analysis tools and, and methodologies so that we can support investors and governments as they plan, uh, prioritize and prepare. Uh, we've seen how important it is to rehearse for a health emergency. We're less equipped to, to prepare and practice for a climate one, uh, but equally it's more important. The threat is larger and there is no vaccine against climate change. Um, so we need to see greater planning and preparation for both better early warning and disaster response. And we're working to this end through the risk-informed early action partnership. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be seeing a, a pledging event in the coming months that will provide a forum for raising commitments ahead of COP26. And of course, CDRI's own works promotes uh, the resilience of new and existing infrastructure systems to, to climate and disaster disaster risks, and we're very pleased uh, to be a part of that. Uh, 
Um, and uh, finally, on planning, we're encouraging all countries to come forward to COP26 with ambitious adaptation communications. Uh, they're invaluable tools for demonstrating progress. They provide an overview of the adaptation planning process and action. And of course, they will outline where further work and support is needed, which creates the opportunities for private sector investment and involvement. Which brings us on to action. The second area we need to see progress in COP26 is action. Um, Sometimes adaptation and resilience in, in my private view risks being sort of theory rich and action light. Um, so we need to change that at COP26. We need to drive action on the ground, uh, working with and for local communities and the most marginalized groups. Uh, and we need to show that progress is genuinely happening on the ground ahead of COP26. Uh, two concrete examples, the Adaptation Action Coalition, which the UK launched with Egypt, the Netherlands and, and a number of other countries, uh, and of course UNDP, uh, most recently uh, with and we will be holding sectoral events uh, ahead of COP26 on infrastructure, on water, on health that will hopefully enable countries to work together on local, regional and global solutions uh, to enhance adaptation and resilience. Uh, I'd also highlight the race to resilience that my, my good friend Nigel Topping is driving forward as, as the UN High Level Climate Action Champion, driving action on resilience building through businesses, civil society, cities and regions through a partnership of regional national and global initiatives. Uh, and that aims to build the resilience of 4 billion people from, through, uh, from vulnerable groups and communities uh, to climate risk by 2030. But of course, action will be difficult without finance, which is the third area where we uh, need to see progress for COP26. Uh, we will need to uh, increase the availability and efficiency and accessibility of adaptation of finance through both public and private sources. Uh, and this is part of a, of a larger issue, which you'll all be aware of, of ensuring all donors significantly increase their public finance commitments ahead of COP26 and deliver on the 100 billion that was promised uh, at Copenhagen and again at Paris. Uh, the UK has doubled uh, its contribution to, to international climate finance uh, to 11.6 billion pounds, and we're encouraging, we're encouraging other countries uh, to do the same so that we can deliver on that $100 billion uh, goal. Uh, but it's not just quantity, we need to also focus on the quality of, of climate finance. Uh, it needs to reach down more to local levels. Uh, uh, the use of climate finance has got to be alert to issues surrounding gender, uh, and it requires both public and private finance. Uh, and as, as John Haley has mentioned, an integration of risk into investment decisions. Um, we want to see a greater proportion of that uh, international climate finance focused on adaptation uh, and resilience investments. Uh, and um, we need to make sure that the, the, the hundreds of billions that will come out of uh, be mobilized by, uh, by governments as part of our, our commitments through the Paris Agreement uh, are joined by private sector trillions. Um, and John Haley has, has highlighted the, the CCRI, uh, which aims to transform uh, investment decision making. And, and one of the things that we are doing in the UK to try and transform investment decision making is make sure that all the UK public firms uh, by 2023 uh, make uh, disclosures in line with the task force for carbon related financial disclosures that will become mandatory in the UK. Um, so I think if we deliver on those three areas of uh, planning, action and finance, uh, then hopefully on the train home from COP26, we will feel that we have made some progress uh, in advancing this most important of debates. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Merton. That was uh, a, a very, very um, compelling articulation of uh, what success could look like, those three pillars of planning, action, finance, and a number of initiatives, Adaptation Action Coalition, Race to Resilience, REAP, uh, CDRI, CCRI are, are coming together to work in that direction. Perhaps I could ask you a brief follow-up question. Uh, if you had one headline message to the government, civil society, academia, what would that be uh, between now and November? Gosh, that's a difficult question. I think um, the, 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 the overall message for COP26 uh, as a whole needs to be that we are sending the world uh, on uh, an accelerating and an irreversible path to on the transition to a low carbon economy that the the, the the world is transitioning to become a low carbon economy and that's that that process is accelerating and irreversible um, and in the space of adaptation and resilience in particular I think we need to to take uh, take full stock of what's happened with the the covid epidemic around the world um, 
uh, and not to take it at all lightly, but to highlight COVID has highlighted, uh, as John Haley was mentioning, one of the sort of, you know, the long tail risks that we see in textbooks, but sometimes are difficult for policymakers to really live and experience. We've seen that now. Uh, and so if, if, if COVID-19 does nothing else, uh, let it be a warning that actually we need to, to invest heavily in preparing for the much greater risks uh, of, of the presented by, by, by climate change in the longer term. Thank you very much. I think that's a very clear message that we are on irreversible path to a low car carbon economy. A clear message on the adaptation side as well. Uh, perhaps I could uh, get back to uh, Mr. John Haley. So you uh, painted a very optimistic picture of uh, how the private sector, particularly the financial sector, is coming together to address the challenges that are before us. Uh, in, in, in doing what you want to do, what is your ask of the governments? What should governments do? You know, uh, Achim Steiner highlighted some of those issues in his remarks uh, to make uh, a more compelling case for the financial sector, for the private sector to move towards investments in adaptation and resilience. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Kamal. And I think both uh, Mami Mizutori and Akam Steiner uh, talked about uh, public-private partnership in, in the way I see it. But let me just say, I think um, governments play a key role in assisting the private sector through providing information and uh, mandating certain disclosures. Uh, while if they leave room for the private sector to innovate, uh, how these disclosures are constructed. And so, for example, in this regard, TCFD, I think, is a model. Uh, I think that works perfectly in terms of uh, government setting out the mandate and then letting the uh, private sector work like that. The, the private sector is always looking for um, strong, specific signals from government to guide their decisions. Uh, so that includes uh, regulatory initiatives, it includes uh, policy actions in terms of facilitating or accelerating certain actions, uh, it includes investment plans. But for government to do this, they require a clear and strong economic case for them to be uh, deploying these initiatives. And so at CCRI, we believe that in parallel to a strong ask to governments, we also need to be equally supportive in advancing and guiding core solutions for um, government decision making. And, and the governments have done really an excellent job, I think, over the last years, recognizing the materiality of physical climate risks to national value. Um, and their mandates to deliver social and economic progress. And, and indeed, I think CDRI is one of the leading examples of that. Um, but again, despite this great progress, I go back to the point I made earlier, we really lack the analytics to inform decision making in a granular way. And so for this, what we need is uh, methodological and uh, metric consistency to, uh, to, to measure, um, to manage, and then to reward resilience. And this is, needs to be a collaborative effort, a collaborative effort across OECD and non-OECD countries, uh, among uh, private and uh, public sectors and industries. And one of the key challenges that I think we've had to date is how disconnected this, um, th this particular discussion has been. And the thing that I find so encouraging about um, organizations like CDRI and the discussion we're having today is this is an example, I think, of the way forward. So let me just uh, lay out, I think, in terms of some specific asks uh, from government, but maybe also from the private sector. Um, we need governments to send a strong signal regarding their commitment to work towards a progressive and a complete integration of physical climate risks into each element of their decision making. So not on a piecemeal basis, but really across the board from procurement to national planning. We need governments to advance international standards for the measurement of systemic resilience. Um, that, what do I mean by that? I mean an assessment of how uh, current and projected macro uh, indicators like uh, GDP, inflation, interest rate properly reflect uh, exposure to physical climate risks. And then last, with regard to attracting uh, private capital, 
I think the ask is for a targeted and uh, limited in time deployment of risk sharing instruments uh, and or policy incentives that attract private capital to complement public investment. Um, and in a matter of five years, develop a uh, powerful proof of concept for how efficient allocation of capital results in both um, systemic and asset resilience. And so I think the one of the things we've seen from the work of the CDRI and I think from the work of CCRI is that the private sector is very keen to work together and support public actors with the analytical solutions. Um, and if we can do this right, that's what's going to deliver the ultimate resilience value, uh, the protection of uh, economic, social and ecosystem value in any country for the next 20 years. Protecting all of those at the same time delivering uh, attractive risk adjusted returns. Very much, very en encouraging, very clear uh, asks of the government. Uh, the, uh, the chapeau level sends specific strong signals, and in the details, you know, make information available, made the regulatory environment uh, conducive, set standards for assessing systemic risk. And I think your offer of you know, bringing in private sector in providing some of those analytical tools is, is really uh, something which is required. Now, we have many questions from uh, the audience. Uh, and as I read them, many of them have been covered in the discussion we've had so far. But there are a couple questions that I will pose. And I will not direct it to a specific uh, panelist. Uh, you can choose uh, to answer uh, if you wish to. More than one can answer as well. If no one answers, then I will pick, pick one panelist. Please allow me. Um, so one question is, uh, it is good to talk about people-centered infrastructure, but how can people-centered infrastructure design, planning, and implementation can be driven toward primarily towards green infrastructure and nature-based solutions. So people's participation in uh, green infrastructure and nature-based uh, solutions. So uh, anyone would like to come to uh, that question? I will just start because I know that um, Akim is a great champion of nature-based solutions in talking about prophecy. Akim was talking about this years ago, so I'm sure um, he can give a better answer, but nature-based solution is really the talk of the town now. And it is a solution that can do many things simultaneously, of course, adaptation, mitigation, disaster risk reduction, but importantly, I think social protection as well, because it does provide the communities um, not only a way to be more resilient to the disasters, but also it creates jobs, uh, when it's about uh, planting trees or you know any other um, nature-based solution, um, using seeds which are more resilient to climate change. Um, it is at the same time really a method that um, is uh, makes uh, all these um, measures, adaptation, mitigation, DRR, uh, people-centered. So I do believe that um, yes, um, nature-based solution is um, the solution that we need to uh, focus on more. And somebody told me, which I thought was really interesting, nature-based solutions don't, don't happen naturally. And that's true. It has to be uh, done in a systemic, systematic way. But I'll stop here because I'm sure Akim has a much uh, profounder thought about this. No, not at all profound, Kamal, if I may just come in, but just to say that I think People-centered infrastructure has something to do with, first of all, recognizing that there are very different um, needs and realities for people. You know, we still live in a world where if you were seven on this panel, one of us would have no access to electricity. This is the 21st century. A billion people, roughly, do not have access to electricity today. How much do they matter uh, in a national energy strategy? Because they're not the vocal ones. They're usually people in the you know, remote areas, in the rural economy, they don't have the same voice as, you know, city dwellers who will go on the streets as soon as the lights go out. So, you know, there is a responsibility for us to, to first of all, also look at what is an equity lens with which we can approach infrastructure when it comes to access to, to energy, for instance. And a second challenge, and maybe John can also comment on that. I mean, the story of 
infrastructure investment in part has often dictated technology choices and um, let's say market focus because there is an economies of scale argument that you know drives us in the investment markets to look for large concentrated infrastructure so it is simply easier for a financial market for a large company to build a power station that costs a billion dollars um, and a thousand megawatts generating capacity than to invest in distributed off-grid access to energy. This is where government has to you know, provide incentives, has to also look at sectoral policies and fiscal policy um, because that is how you prevent, in a sense, people's ability to inform and also shape investment decisions. So, the energy sector, I think, is a very interesting one. And it's not about large versus small. Partly digitalization has allowed us to come with entirely new business models where with digital infrastructure, you can now have a consortium of investors who have the capital deliver 100,000 solar panels into a rural economy where traditionally those households would never have had the money to invest in the infrastructure. But they need electricity. They can now do online charging, pay-as-you-go systems. I mean, these are the the frontiers of changing the infrastructure investment world with a stronger people focus. And uh, just to reinforce Mami's point also about nature-based solutions, we have a lot of people around the world who actually still depend directly on nature to survive for their livelihoods. We all depend on it, uh, you know, even urban city dwellers. Water doesn't come out of a tap, it comes out of a watershed. But that part of our economy is so underexposed that the investment world, as much as public policy, often neglects this. And I think if I were to take that notion of people-centered infrastructure, these are some elements that inform it. Many others are there. And Dr. Mishra, in fact, spoke to, to others as well. Thank you. It was uh, a, a very, very uh, profound um, uh, exposition of the whole notion of people-centered and its connections with nature and nature-based uh, solutions, the issues of equity, uh, issue, issues of technological choice, the tension between economies of scale versus distributed systems. I think we'll have to end this conversation today here, although there are many questions, uh, some of them uh, deep questions which require uh, longer deliberation, but we will, that's an ongoing conversation that we will continue. I would like to, I will not try to summarize uh, everything that has been said, but it has been an extremely, um, an extremely rich session with a lot of ideas for action uh, in the months and years to come. Uh, and uh, with, uh, uh, with many uh, options, with many rays of hope as well. Uh, and we just have to come together. I think the kind of partnership that we are seeing here is exactly what we need. And we need to just uh, continue to forge ahead and, uh, and build back or build forward as Akim keeps uh, staying again and again. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you very much, all the panelists, for making time to engaging in this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we close the day. Close the day, and uh, tomorrow's session will start at 10 a.m. Indian Standard Time with uh, a regional forum focusing on issues uh, of uh, small island developing states in the Pacific Islands. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.